Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics. Today I want to show you how you can build your own electronic dice. In the last video we talked about how to make an LED blink using microcontrollers. And that covered all the basic topics, how to write the code for the controller, how to put it onto the controller, how to hook it up with an LED, and that's all nice and fine, but it's kind of boring. So for this time I thought let's do something that's slightly more interesting, and that is why I thought let's build an electronic dice. But how does a dice work? Well, I mean this one. We just throw it and it gives us a random number between 1 and 6, right? But why is it random? It's not actually random. If we had a powerful computer that would analyze how we throw it, then it could predict with 100% accuracy what kind of number would be on top when the dice comes to rest. So it's not really a random number, we just think it's a random number because we cannot predict it, right? The electronic dice that we're going to build today works a lot in the same way. So what happens when we press this button here? Well, all the LEDs go on, right? Well, that's not really true. You see, like some of them are a little bit dimmer, some of them are a little bit brighter, and that's because the dice goes through the numbers 1 to 6 really, really quickly. And when we release the button, it stops doing so and eventually comes to a stop. Now, we cannot predict what the outcome of this dice throw is because the controller counts through so quickly. It's impossible for us to know what the outcome of the throw is going to be. So in that sense, it is a random number for us, even though the program itself is completely deterministic. I think this is kind of cool. If you think this kind of stuff is boring, then forget about it and let's get to building the thing. This is the schematic of the electronic dice. On the left hand side you can see the PIC16F627A microcontroller that we used last time as well. It is connected to plus 5 volts and ground in the usual way. You can also see a push button called S1 that connects the port RB7 to ground and this is the green button that controls the dice. Now what about those funny looking symbols here, L1 to all the way to L9? Well, they are the connections to the LEDs. On the right side you see the LEDs. So each LED has a 220 ohms resistor and then the LED itself and then the connection to ground. But then the other side of the LED is also connected to one of those funny looking symbols. Now what does it mean? Well these symbols are actually called labels. And L1 and L1 shows up twice, right? Just as well as all the other labels. And that means that L1 here and L1 here have to be connected. In the same sense that we have to connect L2 to L2, L3 to L3 and so forth. You get the idea. The reason I drew it this way and not the connections explicitly is that the, the schematic looks a lot cleaner and simpler this way. But wait, didn't we just forget something? What about the software? How does the pick know what to do? Well, here it is. It's a bit longer than the LED blink code from last time, but it can be roughly divided into two parts. The first part is all about setting up the controller, tell it where the LEDs are located and where the push button is connected. In the main function, we then set all LEDs as outputs and the push button pin as an input. We also set up some variables that do the counting for us. Part two is the main loop. There are two things we need to do, react to the push button and show the number the dice has thrown. These lines here react to the push button press. If the button is pressed, the counter is increased and if it is above 12, it gets reset. Why 12 and not 6? I'll explain that in just a second. This part here becomes active when the push button is released and all it does is slow down the dice roll for about half a second. This is just so that the dice doesn't stop too abruptly and it looks a bit nicer. In the last part, we take the counter variable and set the LEDs. Each counter number corresponds to a number represented on the dice. We have all numbers in here twice, which is why we count from 0 to 11, because some numbers can be rotated by 90 degrees. This makes the dice look a little bit more interesting, I think. And that's it! Now we can compile the code by clicking on the hammer symbol up here and obtain our hex file. If you're interested in the details of the software, I invite you to go to the companion article to this video on my website. I'll put the link in the description and down here as well. So now we have to take this hex file that contains the dice code and transfer it onto the pick. So let's do that next. 
First, we need to build a little programming board that we will use to connect the PIC kit to the PIC controller. And now we switch over to the computer screen. There it is. And we click and click on program. And programming is complete. So yeah, that's it. Now you can disconnect the PIC kit and we can actually take the PIC out of this impromptu programming board that we just made. If you're getting a little bit lost right now and don't know how to flash the hex file onto the PIC controller, then don't worry about it. We have a video that talks about all these details. All right, now the hex file is flashed onto the PIC controller and we can start building the circuit. Let's do it. I considered a bunch of different LEDs for this project and eventually I settled for ultra bright ones. These ultra bright LEDs have a special property and that is if you look at them face on, they're indeed very, very bright and much brighter than the other ones. But if you tilt it by 90 degrees, you see that these LEDs are actually quite dim. And that is because the housing is transparent and it has a lens that is built into it. You can see this when you take a piece of paper and hold it close to it, that the beam angle is indeed very narrow. So we have to do something to diffuse the light while keeping the brightness. So there are two things to do. First, we have to connect these LEDs to some wires and some resistors so we can mount them nicely into the housing. And secondly, we have to frost the clear housing using some sandpaper. Montage time. Here you can see the LED up close. Now we're going to take some sandpaper and sand the housing of the LED to make it more diffused. And you don't need to do a lot, um, a little bit is fine, so don't overdo it, um, but make sure that you do it um, equally from all of the sides so that each side will be the same luminous intensity afterwards. Let's, let's have a look at what we have done, um, just as a small interruption. So you see the left one is nice and frosty and the right one is an original LED that we haven't done anything to yet. And when we switch on the light, we see that uh, they look quite different, right? You see already from the side, you see the, the frosted one emits light in almost all the directions, whereas this one is very dim and almost only emits light just straight ahead. And if you take the piece of paper that we looked at at the beginning, and you compare the beam angles, you see very clearly, well, if I separate those LEDs a little bit, you see very clearly what's going on here. You see the first one still, the clear one has this very narrow angle, but the other one is very open and emits light in a lot more directions than it used to. So that's exactly what we want. Here you can see all the LEDs next to each other. And on the very right, you can see the frosted LED that we just sanded. See from the side, it's now nice and bright, but it's still a kind of a small glowing dot. And for our dice, it would be nice to have a little bit of a bigger LED, but those tend to be very expensive or very dim. So what we can do is we can put in an extra diffuser and what works really well are ping pong balls cut in half. And here you see one of those guys. And when you place it over this LED, you see it gets illuminated quite nicely. So how do we cut the ping pong balls? I use an X-Acto knife and I hold the ping pong ball in my left hand because I cut with my right. And um, you can look in a little bit and you see there is a seam. I hope you can see there is a seam where um, the two sides of the ping pong ball have been fused together. And we can use that to guide our knife while we make the cut. And that will help us to stay more or less in a straight line. So I position it like this, insert the, ping, uh, insert the exacto knife, and there's gonna be a puff of air because these are gas filled. Yeah, you just heard that hopefully. And now we just move the knife back and forth and then rotate the ball a little bit. Back and forth, rotate the ball. Very small movements so that then that way the cut is gonna become more or less nice. Um, you can tell I already messed it up here a little bit. It's not exactly straight. 
I hope that it doesn't matter so much in the end, but just try to stay on the seam. It'll make your life simpler. At the end, these things, they will come apart because these are exactly, they're very flimsy. So be very careful when you end and just use a little bit of pressure and just count on the exacto knife to cut it for you. And there you go. Now we're almost done with our electronic dies. We have all the bare components. We just need to plug them into the breadboard, hook them all up and mount them in this housing here. Now we can take a fresh breadboard, take the pick that we just flashed and put it in there and then take our breadboard power supply module that we used last time as well, plug it in here like so and connect these three wires. The first one is just the positive uh, power supply for the pick. The other one is the negative one, the other side. And the third one is the master clear connection that we have to put permanently on plus five volts as well. Now here we can see everything that we need. We have our pick breadboard with uh, the power supply readily mounted. We have our nine LEDs. We have our switch or push button and we have the nine ping pong halves that we just cut. Now we have to put it all together. And as a housing, I bought one of those very simple cardboard boxes. And as you can see, those boxes, well, they're not, maybe they're not super pretty, but they're definitely very, very cheap. So this one cost me $1.25 and you can find similar ones just about anywhere. Um, it has a detachable lid and we will mount the LEDs in this lid. This one will later accommodate the breadboard in this way and we will mount the switch on top. But let's not uh, do everything at once. Let's do one thing at a time and let's start with the lid and mounting the LEDs. So here's our lid and the LEDs have a diameter of five millimeters. So what I want to do is actually I want to drill the holes and I have my, my drill here so I can just do that. But first I have to mount the positions and how I will do this is a combination with uh, this digital caliper here and just a regular ruler. So let's give that a try. So this is set to zero and the whole thing is, well, roughly 140 millimeters across. So half of this is 70 millimeters. You can just mark, mark the center like this and this way and this way. And now we have a center mark right about here. Yeah, one way to do it is you can just balance it on your finger and see if it falls over or not. I'm gonna call this good enough. All right, now I'm gonna measure the rest. So um, there are also these ping pong balls and they have a diameter um, of, well, I mean, I haven't measured them. Let's see, roughly, well, 37 millimeters. Let's call this with a little bit of extra, let's call this uh, 45. And so we can actually put the other ones here, put the other one here. I'm just tracing out 45 millimeter from each side here and here. So we just measure where we have to put our holes. So these are one, two, three, four, five, and those two are still missing, but we can do that fairly easily because we can just extrapolate this the good thing about using these diffusers is also that um, it doesn't really matter if the holes are super accurate um, because um, it's going to be evened out by those diffusers. So let's just put them in here and see if this actually also fits. And as you can see, it fits quite nicely. So this is how it's going to look like. And now we just have to uh, drill the holes for the LEDs and glue them in place. So let's do that next. Actually, you know what, I'm just going to use a smaller drill as a pilot hole, actually. So let's take a smaller drill bit like this one here and um, go like this. Yeah, that's a lot easier. So let's do that. Next. And now we can finish the holes. OK, 
Okay. Just a little bit of glue is probably fine. Um, I'm going to let the hot glue dry for a second. But what we can do in the meantime is we can think about the switch and where to mount it like this. And then we make a mark here. So now we can just say, okay, let's put this somewhere here. Let's be safe and put it somewhere in the back so that um, it doesn't interfere with the lid once we slide it on. I messed it up a little bit because it's, um, you know, it's no longer a perfect circle, but I think it should be okay. So this thing now, yeah, it comes through. You see it right here. And we can put the nut on top and just kind of like twist it in place. And then nobody will ever know what happened here. Here's one last thing to consider. And that is um, we have to connect this to power somehow, right? This circuit. So there's a USB cable that connects here. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna put this breadboard in here like so, but of course we need to kind of uh, make sure that the power can be connected. So I'm gonna cut a little bit of a slot right just in here so that we can actually pass through this USB cable. That's one of the nice things of working with a cardboard. Um, an X-Acto knife cuts through like butter. It's amazing. Well, it fits through. Oh, I almost forgot. Oh yeah, that was nice. Let's connect the switch to our circuit. And we have to connect one of those to ground. So let's plug this one into this ground uh, rail on this side over here. And then this one has to go to pin RB7 or pin 13. So now this one is connected. And now we have this rat's nest of our LEDs here that need to be connected to the pick controller and that is a lot of work it is a little bit messy but it can be done it's not very tough the only thing i recommend is um, remember that we called these um, leds one two three four you know um, how they correspond to those of a to the uh, configurations of a dice and we called them a one two three four five six i put those numbers on the inside and of course make sure when you do this then they're going to be mirrored they're going to be one two three like this and this makes it easier to hook up the connections. Each LED has a green and a, a black cable. And the green cable is plus and the black cable is minus. So, so black is going to be connected to the ground rails uh, for all the LEDs. So all we need to connect is these nine remaining green cables here to the pick. And I'm going to do this now. I'm going to fast forward because it's not very interesting. And I'll see you on the other side. And that was it. So let's connect our power supply cable, turn it on, and let's look at the LED. So I'm gonna let's like jam this in here a little bit, like this. We can't fully close this because the cable comes out on this side. We're just checking this right now. So that look looks good. That looks like a one. So let's press the button here. And this looks like a six. We can now really glue this in. These cables are kind of stiff, right? So I like to compress them a little bit this way. And then when we close it, hopefully it'll stay shut. Well, if it doesn't, then we later have to use um, some sort of glue. But for now, we can just uh, do it this way. So I don't really want to glue this uh, shut permanently. So I'm going to use this kind of paper glue here, which is um, quite easy. So it turns out this uh, glue stick was not the best idea. So um, I'll go with this kind of tape here instead. Cut this in half and I'm going to put this in here like this. So that's great. So this thing is done. So for mounting the ping pong balls, I'm just going to use hot glue and it helps to switch the dice on. So you can just, you know, have all these things glowing and then you can actually position the 
uh, the pink one ball quite nicely. And um, maybe on the other ones, I'll put two dabs of hot glue on both sides. So maybe I want one on this side here and one on the opposing side, and then we should be safe. So let's try this one here. Like this. And um, yeah, that's just how we do it. And there we go. I think that's fairly smooth. Um, I think it turned out pretty nice. It looks pretty cool. Um, the effect of like these switching around looks pretty nice to me. I think this is a pretty cool project and uh, yeah, I think we're done here. All right, this is the electronic dice. It is now fully working. We built it together step by step and I hope you really enjoyed this project because I sure did. It's always nice to have an actual project that you build from start to finish. Don't forget that there is a companion article to this video that includes details on the software, the components, where you can buy them with lots of additional information and I'll put the link one more time right here and it's also in the description. If there are any remaining questions, please let me know in the comments down below and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much for taking the time, for tuning in and I'll see you next time.